Yeah. Okay, there we go. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining today's uh, working group progress updates meeting. Um, today, we're going to go through each of the groups having representatives present uh, what you all have been working on, some of the things that have been accomplished, goals looking forward towards GCC 2023, uh, any blockers, and then um, any ways that kind of working across working groups is uh, in your plans. Um, so before we dive into that, I just wanted to give an update about that uh, Galaxy working group spreadsheet that I sent around um, that I asked everybody to update and then how did you down if you didn't. Um, so really the goal here is to let the working group leads and the PIs know um, the kind of work that you wanna be focusing on in Galaxy. Um, and so with the structure of the working groups, this is, would also involve kind of attending the groups uh, and participating at those meetings as well. Um, so just wanting to make sure that you have access to all the right resources and um, being in the right places like the working group meetings and channels and kind of relevant issues and PRs, uh, et cetera. Um, and also kind of making sure that we have the right view of uh, how much you wanna focus on a particular activity. So uh, this is just a screenshot of the working groups and the projects that we have. Um, so, you know, you might wanna be devoting 50% of your time to back end, uh, and that way we make sure that the back end folks don't assign you um, things that will take up all of your time or projects that are you know too small. So making sure that there's the right level of uh, tasks there assigned uh, to different folks. Uh, and then as we've been kind of discussing this spreadsheet as well, uh, there are a couple of things that came up that uh, we decided would be really helpful to add. One is a column of uh, Galaxy non-specific tasks. So maybe you're working on something that's outside of our kind of structure of working groups and projects. Uh, so it would be helpful to, uh, if you have any updates to your activities to make that update there, uh, where there's something you might be working on that's still related to Galaxy, but doesn't kind of fit into one of these uh, existing, um, I guess, places. Uh, and then also, uh, there might be things that you're working on outside of Galaxy. So uh, the point being there that your effort doesn't necessarily need to add up to 100 if you have kind of other focuses outside of Galaxy. Um, but really, this is just to make sure we have kind of an appropriate view of who's participating where um, to make sure that you're involved uh, where you want to be um, and at the right levels. Any comments there? All right. If not, then we can dive into the updates. So first up is testing and hardening. Um, so I just wanted to remind everyone about the testing and hardening group that we're, you know, our sort of main focus is on producing tests and, and content. So less, it's less project driven than the other working groups that a lot of us are involved in. Uh, what we've done since our last report in October, we did the release testing of 23.0. Um, the link in this document has a nice community presentation um, that John and the rest of the team put together. That was really great. We added deployment tests so that we can run our, our all the tests that we're producing or a lot of the tests that we're producing against the public servers. And we can build this into our release process and make sure that things are um, running smoothly bef before we do deployments, after we do deployments, before we do the manual testing, et cetera. Um, a big exciting project we did is as part of this uh, tool shed replacement that I'll talk a little bit more about in the back end working group. Uh, there's uh, playwright testing infrastructure um, that replaces all the older tool shed uh, test stuff. And then other than that, we've done a bunch of new tests and like just sort of, uh, you know, the, 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 the type annotations, the things we're doing in the back end and the front end groups, uh, just sort of migrating code um, and, and updating infrastructure. Um, that, and that's what we've done since the last report. Uh, okay, so John, do you want to take over from here? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, GC, uh, what we, uh, with regard to items we plan to uh, address prior to GCC 2023. So, first of all, obviously, we will conduct the release testing for the next release 23.1. Uh, we uh, have considered expanding the testing tutorial. We have a fairly large testing tutorial which covers uh, API and unit tests. Uh, we are planning to add a section on 
uh, either end-to-end -end testing or integration or client testing. It's a large testing tutorial. It's good as is, but growing it, well, makes sense because that tutorial hopefully helps other contributors, especially new contributors, um, add tests to their uh, contributions to the code base. Ongoing work on testing infrastructure. So our focus will be obviously on deployment tests, as John has already mentioned. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there will be much rewriting of the database access code in the testing infrastructure. And that goes hand in hand with our work on migrating to SQL Alchemy 2.0. Uh, and that of course will include adding much documentation to our uh, database access code in the testing infrastructure. Uh, systematic improvement of test coverage. So in addition to obviously writing more tests, uh, we always think about how to simplify the test writing process for new contributors. So with that regard, uh, one, we are going to, well, ourselves, we are going to prioritize features that lack test coverage and features which are important and also are known to break. So this will be a focused effort. Uh, Sam, thank you for coming up with that idea. We've discussed it many times in the past, but finally we've put it on the roadmap. Uh, and the second is we will be improving documentation on Galaxy's testing utilities, specifically the database access utilities. They are already being used by new contributors and that's not very straightforward code to use. So since we're rewriting that, we will be adding much documentation. Release testing 23.1, 23.2 and ongoing. Uh, probably the main changes are, well, one, we're selecting the team in advance. Uh, and again, the link to current schedule uh, contains uh, a listing of all the potential testers. So all the staff members who uh, can participate in uh, release testing. So again, I will be contacting the PIs one of these coming days uh, just to make sure we're not missing anybody, that we're not missing any teams. Um, deployment testing will be, conduct will be conducted prior to manual testing, and that will help us focus uh, the manual testing efforts on the things which cannot be easily automated. Uh, with that regards, we will be putting even more focus on the key features, uh, most of which appear in user-facing release notes. So with that regard, we will be working, the, the release team, release manager will be working together with the authors of these features to generate some kind of explicit descriptions of the features so that uh, the testing team can dive, dive deeper and to focus even more on uh, making sure that they work as expected. Uh, and long-term goal not scheduled as of yes, not uh, as of yet. Uh, no bandwidth for that yet. Performance testing, load scalability, stress testing, fault tolerance testing. We're we're well aware of these items. They are critical. They are important, and we'll get to them uh, as soon as we have enough bandwidth. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, Marius. I'm I'm interested in everyone's opinion on the. You know these release notes because i mean ideally everything would be fully automated but that's hard for certain components I, i'm wondering john maybe you could say a little bit more about what sort of information you want to see in those notes and how that will guide testing well um the release notes themselves first we we wrote them prior to release testing then we started to completing them after release testing uh, so we don't need release notes per se as they appear in their final state uh, in the release documentation. What would help is having an itemized list of a description, an explicit description of a feature which we are going to include in the user-facing release being a key part of the release, what makes the release. So not just uh, we have a new history in this release, but the new history allows you to do X, Y, Z and does A, B, C differently from what it has been until now. The idea here is to shield, uh, not shield, but probably help the release testing team focus on trying to break these items as opposed to coming up with a list of what this feature needs to do based on related PRs. So again, I'm not seeing this as we need the 
final release notes in advance, but more like we need a list of things to test so that the release team, many of which sometimes are very new staff members who don't have much experience with Galaxy and the Galaxy code base, can have a specific list of items to address. But it could be as simple as, as almost like a bulleted list of like, make sure these, I don't know, four or five things, you know, behave as you expect. It's more like this is the list of four or five things we expect from this feature. This is what we say this feature does. And the release, the release testing team will try to come up with creative ways to stray off the, you know, the beaten path and break them. But they need to know what to break. Okay. That makes sense. And, you know, again, I, I see, you know, that as being a major need for things that cannot be automated. Um, but, you know, there's also, you know, unit tests and integration tests and other forms of testing that we can do to, to automate. I guess the, the kind of the follow-up question is, is there other, I mean, you call out, you know, performance testing as something that could, be, could potentially be done. Are there other types of testing, other opportunities that you see, you know, ultimately, you know, automation is the key to get, um, you know, good coverage over such an enormous code base? Uh, probably. I, mean, the... I think that's an ongoing thing, right? We, we've been adding, sort of end-to-end -end tests, integration tests, tests of different Galaxy configurations um, for a long time. I mean, workflows have tests, tools have tests. I I think that performance is called out because it feels like the one piece where we consistently don't have a way to address uh, problems that come up. I think all the other issues that we encounter, we usually, you know, if there's a, if there's a testing lack, we usually kind of can point at the PR and say, well, there should have been a test there and there wasn't. And and that's going to happen, right? We don't have, we don't we don't have a hundred percent test coverage, and we don't insist on it. But um, but we do encourage tests of, of all sorts, and we we have infrastructure for a dozen kinds of tests um, to handle. I think nearly every situation uh, for these bugs that are arising. I'm with you. I'm with you. I mean, this is going to be um, an iterative approach for you know, at every step along the way, we'll, we'll just continue to kind of make um, updates. Um, I'm, I'm pleased, I, I just wanted to ask the question if, you know, as you're going through this, if there are other types of tests that are um, potentially relevant, but it sounds like we have good coverage and, and multiple uh, sort of multiple modes of feedback about if there are gaps about how that could be addressed. As, as John said, there are at least a dozen different types of tests we can write and there are that results in thousands of tests that we automatically run on each PR and now with each release. So I suppose one of the goals, one of the overarching goals for us as a, as a, as a team is to simplify the process of writing simpler tests for contributors so that you know we don't have, write all the tests ourselves and we'll encourage best practices like writing unit tests together with writing any addition to the code base. And at the same time, simplifying and improving the testing infrastructure, which is something uh, individual contributors usually can't really take care of. Great. Yeah, actually, I I, I changed my mind. We we did we didn't have deployment tests. Like we weren't running tests against main prior, and we still kind of the things that we've added this release were. Um, you know, they're still pretty experimental and we need to really polish them. But that is another place where things sort of would break down. Um, you know, uh, you know, you add in Ingenix, you add in Celery, you add in these uh, pieces that, that might be missing or might be misconfigured. And so I think the, the deployment test is another place where hopefully over the next year, um, you know, we, we start thinking about like, how would this component perform on main? or on EU or on AU. And then what could we write tests that are, you know, geared towards, you know, what is this going to look like under Ingenix or, or something like that? And there are some key pieces of the code, um, you know, things that are exposed in the UI and in the API um, where, where that will come into play and that, that will hopefully also improve. Database related code it always is also a constant uh, challenge uh, and, and, and a thing we try to improve, we hope to improve it this time. And uh, with regard to testing, so uh, whenever code, test code needs to talk to the database, that's a challenge. The way we handle it currently in our integration tests is we, we load up one database and throw stuff at it. 
Uh, the downside is, uh, well, that makes the tests not quite independent from one another. So a failure in one test or some weird thing happening in the database as a result of one test can affect the next test. At the same time, tearing down the database and putting it back up for each test is tremendously expensive, and that will translate hours of testing into tens of hours of testing. testing. So this is something we're working on. Also migration testing. We don't have, we have plenty of migration tests, but they do not address, uh, they do not check adding uh, what happens to Galaxy when you add a migration. And uh, that, that has been the result of uh, at least one bug. So we, 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 that's on the, that's in our plan to add uh, testing infrastructure, which will enable, which will run automatically whenever the database schema changes. Great. Well, I feel like in the interest of time, we should probably advance to the next uh, topic. But excellent work. Thanks, John and John. Up next, we have the workflows and tools working group. Yep. All right. So we have a few big things that we have implemented over the last term. Uh, we have conditional works, uh, workflow step execution. So you are able to have conditional inputs where the workflow will run if um, if input files are not required, but can alter uh, the workflow run if they are included, uh, as well as step JavaScript expressions for the API, which will allow you to manually write in those Boolean inputs. Uh, we will be getting more into that for uh, for uh, our future goals for GCC is to further, one of them is to expand that. We have improved uh, work reporting for workflow scheduling errors and, and warnings. It's now a whole lot more granular uh, where you can see not only that the workflow failed, but when it failed, why it failed, and what step it's failing on, what, what the specific issues are. And we have error codes that are much more visible to the user for those. Um, a reactive uh, workflow editor um, with, uh, clear state flow, um, it's it's just a lot more visible what what problems are as you are as you are generating it for the user to to be more able to react to it and not hit issues after the fact. Uh, reusable IWC uh, GitHub workflows, uh, significant enhancements to the IWC infrastructure such that testing uh, of new workflows is much more simplified. Um, and it's much more expandable so that people who are not directly involved in the IWC can use said infrastructure on their own workflows and they don't have to be submitting everything to the IWC. They're able to run in the same testing framework without having to necessarily go through us every time. Um, and also um, able to export um, RO is uh, report object crates such that people can export the entirety of workflows and workflow outputs uh, along with all of the metadata and input data and outputs all together in a single object so that a user can have a greater understanding. So it, it can be more easily distributed um, to other people after the fact. It makes it a whole lot more easy for people to understand the whole situation under which the workflow was run initially. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of goals for the next uh, for, for GCC, uh, a standalone workflow graph view such that the user does not have to be able to go into the workflow editor to view what a workflow will actually look like and zoom out and try to understand and, and take your picture specifically in the workflow editor for any time you need to put anything on a presentation. Uh, this is not just for workflows um that have been exported from galaxy but also for static pages for progress views just so that anyone can really understand a workflow much more uh, easily uh step javascript expressions we're looking to expand this boolean um function that has been added for vgp functions and is obviously usable by many other um, groups but we're looking to have more complex expressions such that we can check metadata and and actual values and have multiple conditionals together to have further conditionals within a workflow and make them much more extensible so that you can theoretically have one workflow that could run for a variety of versions as opposed to having several versions of a workflow you have to distribute. Um, executable workflow editor tours. This is similar to how we have tours on major servers right now uh, that can walk you through the issues that the workflow editor being so dynamic, uh, it's been a bit of an issue and we're looking to expand it into functioning in that system. Um, 
improve sub workflow maintenance uh, user story. So that is that currently, if you have a sub workflow uh, that is a part of a major workflow, anytime you edit said sub workflow or distribute said uh, or distribute the larger workflow, the sub workflows are, are not attached. And that can be a bit of an issue if you are making um, fixes to the sub workflow or changes that uh, that need to be reflected across several workflows at the same time. So we are looking into linking uh, the sub the original sub workflows to the uh, to the larger workflows so that a user can not have to edit all of the workflows in which the sub workflow occurs or all of the instances in which said sub -work workflow occurs. Excuse me. Uh, looking to change the execution of all workflows and tool tests to uh, using Pulsar by default. It's just going to be much more simple if it's all using a single framework, and it'll hard and it'll allow us to harden Pulsar support. Um, improve support for job caching framework. Currently, on the back end, a lot of things reply, uh, rely on, for example, the HID, which can be a bit of an issue when you rename files or using a new history where the HIDs are not standard. Uh, and that can cause issues, and we are looking to make that a lot more supported and hardened so that, that those issues don't arise. Um, ports and document more workflow APIs to fast API. Again, better framework, more standard. Um, schema for we, we want to come up with a more standardized schema for job and test definitions just to make it more easy for people to write these tests, that it's not just a couple people writing them and more available for everybody to use. In terms of uh, the tools part of the working group, Further, uh, we're looking to make further enhancements to existing tools and addition of new tool suites for single cell tools. We're currently working with the Bacon Lab um, out of the UK on that. So Tyler, for example, is working on the Fate tool, uh, tool suite. Uh, we're looking to just continue supporting projects as we have been, and we're looking at including more T2T pipeline tools. Uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, so, a question. Well, one question about T2T pipeline tools. These are in Widow, aren't they? Or are I, I believe so. Mike would probably be more poised to answer that. Yes. Um, Widow, but Widows by definition are simply a <coughs> a, a a pipeline mechanism. So, though yeah. it'd be difficult. We could theoretically implement those in 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 a Galaxy tool framework. Okay, and my, my other question about <clears throat> tests. So, or maybe I can talk to I don't know. So, the problem we're having with VGP workflows is that the test data is too big. So I don't see why we can't just run it against some big instances. So that's what you're trying to do with the external test support. Uh, that, uh, that is a big part of it, yeah. Well, thanks. I'm, I'm really curious about these JavaScript expressions. They must be wonderful ones. This is new. Thanks a lot. You're on mute, Alex. Oh, I was just saying, I very much agree. Once those are implemented, it's going to be really useful. So obviously there's a lot of really cool work here, uh, like the conditional workflow execution and so forth. And I'm glad that we're taking a look at sub workflows and how to upgrade those. And ha has a lot of thought been put into how to do this with versioning? Because you can imagine, you know, you have one sub workflow that you're now used to in multiple places and you go in, you edit it, and then maybe you want to update all of the workflows that are using an updated version of that sub workflow, or you don't want to update all of them. And for the ones that you don't update, then when you go back, you want to use that old version. Now you have a, and then you do want to update it, but slightly differently, right? So now you have some sort of branched sort of, and how, how do you at, then go back and access that through the editor work, you know, the editor interface? We had, we had this exact uh, discussion last time. I, I believe that there are two, um, to work, to, two things to, to deal with that situation. First is the manual linking uh, of the sub workflows so that it doesn't automatically update. You have to say, mm -hmm. I want this to auto update from this sub workflow. And second is, is workflow versioning. 
um, because it's running it as a workflow, as a tool within the pipeline. So if you can select a version of that against it and and pin it, that would also work. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, th I think it sounds really great. I, and but it's I, I guess when you're thinking about the right now, we we when we have workflow versions, it's just it's a one to one to one. Right. But if you, you can imagine that if you want to go back later on and start from a different, you know, the, the original one again for a different workflow. Now you, it, it sort of branches, and you know, I, I don't know how that would then be supported by the model. Obviously, it's possible, but uh, it, it gets complicated, I guess, right? It's yeah, I would say that we have we have a, a short term, a medium term, and a long term solution there. Um, and we've discussed. Uh, I mean, I think the long term solution there is an open issue that I created. You know, that these workflows should be viewed as trees instead of lineages. I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the the in terms of like a shorter term thing. You know, just being able once you upgrade a sub workflow, just to see everything that's using it, and you know, sort of go through your workflows, and you know, just like upgrade all these workflows, I think would be a huge, a huge maintenance enhancement for something like VGP, where you have a collection of workflows that are sharing a sub workflow, and you want to upgrade them all at once. And then the medium term, that's somewhere in between there, and, and so that's that's what the uh, that short term is the improved sub workflow maintenance user story here, I think. Mm -hmm. But then the the medium term would be like, you know, if you're using these workflows to cross different servers and stuff, you you when you import a workflow, there it should be able to like be able to remap workflows or and I think part of that would be like, oh, this this lineage no longer matches this workflow, right? This sub workflow, I'm going to take it in a different direction here. So you should be able to like clone it and 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 sort of go from there. Um, and that's not possible in the UI today. But I, there's a, there's a, a wide variety of things we need to do to address this, and I I think there are open issues for most of them. But yeah, yeah absolutely, saying, absolutely, it is a it is a conversation we we've been having. Oh, it's great to hear it. Absolutely. And then and then just from like uh, you know, from an annotation point. So now that you know, versions of workflows are now becoming will become more important. How do you? deal with annotating the difference between versions, right? Are there change logs between, you know, the individual branches where the, the, the workflows change? Could, could that be automated or, cause you know, like just having like a, you know, some hash or whatever isn't very descriptive. Oh, I mean, you're absolutely correct there. And again, yeah. And again, there's a whole series of conversations we've okay. had. I mean, right. I yeah. think part of the refactoring API um, and trying to get everything to go through a, a sort of specific API for updating workflows instead of just sort of in the past, what we did is we said, okay, here's a whole new copy of the workflow. It's a new thing in the lineage. But with the refactoring API that we added a couple of years ago and sort of using that more and more, the idea is like each each kind of change you make to a workflow should be an action. And then we record those actions and and what sort of parameters those actions had. And then we could we could do that. We could do those out of, I mean, that's the whole point of that is to be able to trace things like that and generate change logs. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done there, but I think it's the direction we're definitely heading in. But you're that's absolutely awesome. right. The, 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 the hash is not useful and neither, I mean, I guess what we use right now is just a linear set of numbers, right? Which is also not particularly useful. Yeah, no, that sounds great. I'm glad you're thinking about all of this. Thank Another you. thing that, that, that uh, I, I forgot to mention was uh, at the very least, notifications uh, on update for these sub workflows, such that they th that the updating of that sub workflow removed connections, for example, so that you are aware that even if something is tracking, if it's available to still be connected, it can stay connected. But if it's not, then you are aware that that something has changed within the the downstream workflows that might have a problem. which the editor now supports, right? So in the past, we would just drop links and such, but I mean, Marius's well, work, um, it's amazing this release, yeah. Awesome. There's a ton of new features here. I'm wondering how we can best communicate those to users and workflow developers. There's a Marius is preparing a training at a tool with a new version of the of the workflow, and we're planning to have a workflow development training in GCC as well to go over all these uh, features. So, awesome. Well, I actually think that so Planivo paper is coming out this month. I think it's time to write a maybe a workflow paper because that's that's another way to do it. 
I mean, the other thing is Marius just has a ton of energy. He just talks to everyone all the time and he'll just explain everything to everybody individually. That's just hand out his phone number? Yeah. <laughs> yes, Bjorn, we need to go to conferences. Thanks so much to us and work close group. Up next, we have goats. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So, uh, so the main one of the main um, topic that we're working on right now is the organization of Smogasbor 2023, which is planned for the end of May. And as you can see on the right, we opened the uh, registration not long ago, and it's already exploding all the number from the previous years. Uh, in blue is this year's registrations. And uh, we're functioning this time with a set of module leads. So a group of person each take a module or can be more than one list per module. And what we're doing is we're going over all the tutorial of this module that have videos. Uh, we have a table keeping track of who's reviewing what, what state of the uh, tutorial is in. And uh, the goal is to verify that the tutorial are up to date with the tools and that's still relevant uh, for the uh, technology available. And verify that the video is also up to date with the different um, Galaxy updates. And to contact author and speakers from the video or the tutorial if there's need for modification and help them uh, update all of this material for the uh, training events. And uh, the goal is also to reach out to potential trainer if some tutorial could be interesting to include in the event, but don't have a video for it yet. Uh, so we still need to module lead for proteomics and plant transcriptomic, but uh, all the other module have uh, uh, leads for them. Uh, so it's in the work. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the next big event, of course, is GCC 2023. The re registration is open as of uh, February 2020. We have a page, dedicated page on the hub for it, and uh, we have we are using Eventbrite portal for the registration handling. Uh, the abstract submission is planned to open on February 24, and we have a COVID policy that is uh, linked to the policy of the university uh, on site. Uh, for the conference. Uh, next slide, please. So for the training part, the session will be 2.5 hours. We have five rooms available, so five uh, parallel tracks, uh, and three days of training planned. Uh, so the current working schedule looks like that. We have admin, we have dev, we have uh, genomics, uh, miscellaneous, and um, to miscellaneous, actually. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Asunta is actually recruiting tra trainers, especially trainers that are local in case there's trouble for traveling uh, for the people who are currently assigned to the each session. Uh, so if you have, if you can and want to host training session, or if you have questions regarding the training, uh, please contact Asunta. And we need trainer for ecology. If we don't have, if we don't find trainer for this um, session, we will swap this topic for another one. Um, next slide, please. Uh, finally, the big project in the work is the Galaxy uh, Mentorship Network. So it's a one year anniversary of this program and we've had a poor result with it. Uh, one of the difficulty we have is we're receiving the application um, at any time. And what we're doing is we're publishing them on HackMDIO, uh, or we also try to, to publish them directly into um, metrics. Uh, but it's hard to keep mentor engaged, to read all of them and to vote on what they're interested. And so we have trouble connecting uh, mentee and mentors. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to reorganize the way, way we're doing things. And while the application will keep being sent at any time. Uh, every two months, we're gonna uh, process all the um, application we get from the last two months, uh, go through them, select the one that seemed to have a, a relevant project uh, for this program and publish all of them to the mentors, ask them to vote if they're interested. And if we have orphaned application by the end of this one week, 
try to contact mentor that we think might be appropriate for the uh, mentees. So once we have a concrete new organization, uh, we will contact the mentors and ask if they agree with that plan, if they have suggestions. And uh, once we have the agreement, we're going to ask mentees that already applied uh, if they're still interested and to reapply and uh, start with the clean slates. And to explain all of that, we will publish a blog on the hub to explain, uh, to have a post-mortem of this past year and what went wrong and what we're going to change to make it more efficient. Uh, and that's most of the program for the uh, past and next quarter for the God Group. Hey, Delphine, uh, on the uh, on the smorgasbord thing, what are you guys using to, what channels are you using to advertise this? I mean, it's the, the big spike um, happened a few days ago, I guess, in uh, registrations is quite impressive. Uh, I'm not sure. I will have to ask Elena. Uh, she's keeping track of the number. I'm not sure. Wait, but I mean, is it all from Twitter or uh, personal connections or past registrants? Uh, do you know? who's signed uh, up? I don't know. I, th I think we have a lot of past registration uh, of past participants. Uh, I think they are advertised on the .eu as well, uh, but I don't know. Yeah, I'll ask. That's a good question. Um, why don't we advertise it on .org? We should. Yes. Can we make sure that's going to happen? Yeah. Um, who's the good question to ask for that? Who's the good person to ask for that? Well, I guess if we have, if you have, uh, if you have the graphics and the text, then obviously that's a, just the playbook update. Or, but you know, we can always talk to me. Or if you just want it on the welcome, it's a hub edit. Mm -hmm. I mean, the hub edit. Yeah. But you'd want to, you wouldn't want to displace the GCC 2023 stuff, um, I guess, below that. I mean, we can also like alternate, right? I mean, it doesn't have, like, we can put a week of smorgasbord, then a week of GCC. GCC registration open has been on for a few days. Maybe next week we put the yeah. smorgasbord, then a week later we go back with the GCC abstracts opening, and then again smorgasbord so that it, the, the content's not as static. Uh, we, we can also on the on the on the um, in middle panes on the minimum, on the welcome page we can downsize this Ukrainian banner. I'll guess I'll work on that because we can it can be smaller now. So I'll I'll work with Bjorn on getting it smaller so we have more space. I mean, given the one year anniversary, should we maybe make it bigger for a few days? Uh, I don't know if it's a good anniversary bring more attention to it. How late is um, GCC registration open? Just just thinking about advertising for that, we'd probably want to do that at Smorgasbord somehow, um, just s since you were asking about places they were advertising. Uh, well, I mean, it opened Monday um, and it's open throughout, uh, you know, from now until the conference start. It, okay. Now we're in early and I forget the exact date, but in like mid, I think early May or something, we go to regular and then mid June is um, is late, I think. I forget the dates exactly, but the abstracts close April 2nd. So that, and that, you know, we need to sort of advertise ASAP early on. So people have a month or so to, you know, prepare the abstract. It's not enough to just do it two days before. Your hand um, yeah, for Anna's question. So we also advertised in our local research networks. And I discussed with Helena, so I'm not sure if she did it already. But in TIAS, when people register a training event, there is a checkbox where we ask if we can contact them. I mean, if we can keep their email address to contact them. So I discussed with Helena to kind of... Um, send that also to the people that have used TIAS in the past. So if you do that similar on org or on the Australian um, TIAS, you could also consider that. Okay. 
Awesome. Any other comments for the goods group? If not, up next is systems. Thanks, Delphine. We can't hear you, Nate. Ah, says that it's... Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh. Okay. Um, so uh, the, the uh, EU server has been testing Celery uh, in production um, and figuring out sort of the best way to run that, um, what some of the pitfalls are. Um, there is a in-person admin workshop uh, in the planning stages for uh, April. Um, there has been uh, some interest expressed in that. Uh, it's going to be in Europe, uh, looks like Belgium. Um, and uh, so, so that's in the planning stage, nothing uh, nailed down yet, as far as I know. Um, the Australian server has been running TPV, of course, for a year, I think, plus now. Um, and uh, EU uh, started using it um, in uh, October, uh, has been expanding their deployment. And uh, usegalaxy.org is finally running it in production as well with some, uh, just a couple of tools so far. I've uh, used it. Uh, on the test server for, for more tools for a while, but um, we are finally running it in production uh, on, on usegalaxy.org and for a couple of the Penn State instances that, that I help manage. Um, and it's all going very well. Like uh, there's a lot of stuff that's being enabled by this. It's really, really great. Um, the EU has, uh, I guess, um, had disabled GPU uh, notebooks for a while and now re-enabled them. Um, although you have to uh, get specific access for this for, for sort of obvious reasons um, why they're not just open up to the world. Um, and uh, the uh, group very much uh, wants to uh, be uh, supporting the work for the IDC and especially with uh, John's work on, on the bundles now, which are designed to allow so that the the stumbling block for the IDC so far has been that there are some compute intensive steps that are not good fits for things like uh, GitHub Actions to, to build indexes um, and because there's just not enough compute time or resources. Uh, and so um, what John worked on was the ability to run data managers essentially on the public servers, bundle up their, their outputs, um, and then we can unpackage them into whatever we want, which, uh, and, then, and then share that out to the world uh, via the IDC. Um, and going forward, we want to uh, do more to try and, and collect our annoyances, as we're calling them, I guess. The, the, basically, the things that we um, uh, spend a lot of time um, working on, uh, uh, working around in deploying Galaxy that can be pushed upstream and really is more of a Galaxy problem that should be fixed there rather than in the deployment. Um, it's just sort of an ongoing effort. But as you can see, our uptime has been really good for the main public servers. Um, if you had seen this graph before, it was not always so great. So uh, this is, I think, a, a big accomplishment, uh, not just for the people working on the infrastructure, but uh, for everyone developing Galaxy, um, it's, it's uh, really become a, a great, um, developing and testing, it's really become a great, great service. That's it for us. Is it um, possible to enable GPU for notebooks on main? Uh, we can, we'd wanna do a similar type of of thing, uh, you know, limiting who has access to it. Uh, but it's, we have um, GPU instances of Jetstream that we can get access to, or what we do, um, and we could run them there for sure. Yep. Maybe this is more of a back end question. 
um, are are where are we stand with like Pulsar and sort of um, you know kind of remote execution, remote data? Um, is that has that been propagated to these systems? Yeah. So uh, so I think I don't know what the current stat is. I don't think there's anybody from Australia on the call, but they run the overwhelming majority of their jobs in Pulsar. Um, we are increasingly. I mean, we have. I think it was 40% of our multi-core jobs on, on usegalaxy.org uh, went through Pulsar in previous years, and that's increasing as well. Um, we are, yeah, there's currently no major issues. Uh, there are, you know, some things that are still being worked on, but at this point, I would say Pulsar is pretty mature, and our ability to run jobs in it is pretty mature, and TPV is, is sort of the key to uh, utilizing more and more um, uh, Pulsar resources going forward. Nice. Uh, and then like remote data, maybe again, maybe this is more backend, but what about like remote data or is that, um, is that? Yeah, I think that, yeah. Uh, I think that's more of a backend question currently. Um, I don't know if John, are you gonna talk about that at all on the backend? I mean, um, remote data means so many different things to so many different people that I, mean, I could give you an answer that it's either impossible or it's completely possible today. And I would kind of want to sit down and and talk about the specific, um, you know, use case. Uh, there's certainly, I, I will talk, yeah, I mean, probably, we could probably move that discussion to the back end, but there, there have been advancements for sure. Um, on the deployment side, I guess that EU is is running extended metadata. And so extended metadata is this concept of like, we can keep the data that tools are producing off of Galaxy servers um, by, by doing all the work that used to happen on the Galaxy server after a job was done and doing all of that as part of the job, as part of the compute, on, on the compute. Um, and we've made tremendous progress over the last six months in that in that direction. Um, on the development side, Pulsar um, supports more forms of doing that, more different kinds of uh, configurations. Like if you're running containers and and how that's set up, we support TRS now for doing our not TRS um, TES uh, GA4 GH TES um, can can do that now. Um, and then yeah, and then I think my understanding is that EU is is exploring with deploying a lot of those. So I think we're making good progress. Nice. And, you know, this is outstanding uptime. I'm wondering, you know, if you, what you, and, and may I, you already shared credit with, with basically the whole team, but are, are there already been, have there been, have you noticed any sort of key advances that have improved the uptime? And I guess the, the flip side to it is, you know, I guess there have been a handful of, of off days. Are, are there any, um, any things that we should be looking towards to to pushing it even further or just making sure things are even more robust? Um, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I think the testing has been a, a big part of this and, and uh, certainly um, what John was, John D was talking about earlier with uh, figuring out um, when database issues are, are going to be a problem has been a big uh, key um, in the past. Uh, and so I think a lot of work has been putting in, into making sure that um, our, our queries and, and uh, everything scales up to the level of a large production server. And so the more of that that is done in the future, which testing group talked about quite a bit, um, I, think, I think it's beneficial. Uh, other than that, it was a little bit rocky for a time uh, after the G unicorn switch as we tried to figure out you know, how best to have uh, uh, work on have zero downtime restarts, um, the amount of workers uh, that we could run, the amount of memory that they would consume, which was causing some crashes for a while. Um, and all of that stuff has sort of been worked out through the, 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 the tenure of the 2305 release and now with 23.0, um, things are, are in a pretty good state, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Up next, we have the backend working group. Um, 
so sort of like transitioning quite nicely from this conversation of like uh, remote data, um, one of our key things that we're done, we've done is, I mean, this PR hasn't been merged yet, but it's approved and it's green and it's ready to go. Um, probably merge it this week, I think, is the um, is, a, is, is a huge PR that revamps a lot of object store abstractions. And so this isn't just a backend thing, it's in the UI, it's 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 um in the API, it's it's every place, but it allows um when configured, you could have different object stores and it allows user selection of them, allows object stores to be private, allows multiple different kinds of quotas, and then it allows the admins to send um configure a bunch of information, um, badges. There's a whole visual language for communicating information about the object stores configuration in a very user-friendly way. And that's all in there. And I think all of that is really um, an important stepping stone for being able to do things like bring your bring your own date, uh, bring your own storage to Galaxy. Um, I mean, I, I might argue that Galaxy has been able to support that for a long time, but I think these, these set of action, uh, abstractions and these UI elements really make it a lot uh, more tenable to have a nice user story around it. Um, and so that's, you, you know, that's the next step. I mean, after I think remote data is sort of, you know what what remote data and, and how and 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 I think that PR is going to tackle a lot of that. Um, in addition to that, we did uh, workflow conditionals that we talked a lot about. Um, it was Marius's work? It's uh, amazing. We did the data bundles that uh, Nate explained and explained why they're important. Uh, David did a great job with the auto crate and invocation imports and exports. Um, that's in the latest release of Galaxy. Um, we've done a bunch of Pulsar maintenance, a, a bunch of the upgrades I mentioned for handling remote data better, and just um, those pain points that Nate had mentioned, I think we're slowly solving them. Sometimes we need a little prodding, um, but um, I am impressed with uh, Pulsar's um, ongoing um, a development and, and sort of maintenance. It's great to hear that, that so many servers are running it and uh, it's working so well. I, I added a nice uh, piece of documentation about running containers in Pulsar. Uh, that that looks pretty cool. We added GA4GH DRS support, um, which is again um, another piece of that remote data picture. Um, a lot of people are expressing remote data. Well, uh, GA4GH is express uh, is uh, pushing people towards expressing it as DRS URIs. I don't know if they're actually useful or used, but um, we definitely have support. I put in some initial support, and then Noan. Uh, we just merged this PR from Milan this week. That was amazing. Uh, it was like such a great uh, hardening of that. And like, um, you know, DRS is a pretty open spec and there's a lot of different ways to implement it. And Noan did a, a great job of like, just uh, making it a lot more useful, I think, and a lot, um, a lot better tested. It is just great. Um, we have a feature complete prototype for next generation tool shed. So it's not feature parity. There's a bunch of stuff that we don't want to do. The tool shed does too much stuff. We don't want to do all of that. We, we have a couple key user stories. Um, and so I opened a PR for that. Um, and then uh, David did a great job with uh, remote test data for tools. Um, yeah, again, getting back to these big, big test data is a question we, we had earlier. Um, and this is a uh, support in heading in that direction. And then we've sort of made, I think, really great and steady progress on a lot of our long-term goals. So during the last hackathon, we, we did a bunch of work with Python typing, fast API. Um, as we're doing those things, async becomes easier. Um, I think a lot of the, the backend will be improved as we have a more structured way to think about the way tools um, have their state. Um, and so that's been an ongoing project. And, and that sort of feeds into CWL. And then um, John D keeps making tremendous progress on uh, how our data modeling and SQL Alchemy 2.0. Uh, can we do the next slide? Oh, no, nope. there we go. So that's what we've done, our planning, uh, what we plan to have done before the GCC 2023. Um, this was uh, mentioned in the workflow talk, but improved uh, support for job caching. Uh, I think this is Marius's big push for the next couple months. So I'm sure whatever he produces is going to be amazing because it always is. Um, and that's going to help training. That's going to help VGP. That's going to help uh, workflow developers. It's going to help everybody. It's uh, it's going to be great. Uh, we SQL 2.0, we'd like to make, you know, like to make the switch, I think, pretty soon here. And then make, and then start working on this other project of removing the objects from the database, cleaning up the database in a more permanent way than we do right now um, for performance reasons. 
And then we'd like to merge in and harden this tool shed replacement that, that's open. And then um, coming back to like user-defined object stores and remote data, I, I know that's a big push on the roadmap, sort of identifying the limitations um, and these user stories, because again, I can either say it's completely doable and has been doable for years, or it's completely impossible, depending on you know, what the user story is. And so scoping out a couple of those and addressing the pain points and addressing the limitations, um, I can imagine that's going to be stuff like tying our, our private store, our, our private key store to the object store and serializing that as part of jobs and, and working through those details. But um, I, I think we're in a really good spot and we've made a tremendous amount of progress and I, I expect it to continue. And then developing a plan to get celery on on more of our use Galaxy Star resources, um, which Nate had mentioned. Um, and I think that a lot of the work that we have to do is working with other work groups. So uh, this object store selection PR that I started by talking about is great, but if no uh, servers adopt it, it's kind of, uh, it's not necessarily a useful thing. Um, and so one of the key first uh, use cases is it makes scratch storage really quite easy. You know, you just define two stores and one of them you clean every two weeks. Um, and just let users pick a scratch store. And then it it would be also good uh, thinking about main, if, if maybe IROD's testing could be done this way. Um, you know, if you go in the UI and you go into your user preference and say, I want to use IROD's, and then you run some workflows and you see how far you get with it. And then when it breaks, you switch back and then tell us and we'll we'll work on, you know, fixing those, those bugs. So things like that would be uh, really cool. And they would be really easy to do. You know, it's just one XML file after after the next release. Um, continue to work with the systems group um, on the IDC and getting those data bundles and just sort of allowing community uh, genome uh, annotation. Well, that's not the right word. Uh, you know, creation of genome indices by the community. And then uh, working on with the workflows group. I mean, we've, we've talked about all of these already, but like the remote resources from GitHub Actions, um, working with the systems group to get the new tool shed deployed once that's merged, and then um, working with the UI UX group on developing APIs for installing visualizations. Uh, out past the GCC, um, you know, making more progress towards a secure user-defined object store, and then this modernizing Galaxy tool state project that I think is going to just uh, revolutionize everything about the back end in terms of like better tool execution, better workflow extraction, to make this tool shed possible. Are, are better, more useful. It's going to make um, tooling around tools better, and it's going to allow us CWL. Yeah, and that's that's the back end. Any questions? Uh, well, I mean, it's just amazing progress across the board. Um, I guess at the top of the list, you know, the I think you said the object store abstractions are like. Uh, you know, nearing the finish line here. When and how can we best learn about those? Um, well, the PR, the, uh, the, the PR link, I mean, the, the PR has screenshots and the screenshots are a little bit old, but all of the concepts are the same. And then, you know, hopefully we merge it today or this week. And then the UI team takes and, you know, takes a machete to it and cleans it up. And then a month from now, it's in a really good state. And then with the next release, it will just be part of the release. And hopefully we can work with Nate or whoever ahead of the release to have to have a plan for how, like, I think scratch storage is a really cool thing that would just be right out of the box. So like, if the next release includes, it's such a good question because I don't think about these things, right? Um, if the next release, like as part of the release process, we implement scratch storage, you know, from day one, that would be really great. Um, one 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 of the features in there is that like uh, if you're running a workflow after the PR, if you have different object stores set up, like a main object store and a scratch object store, when you're running a workflow, you could send, and this is implemented today, it's in the UI, all the pieces are there. Um, you can send your outputs to your regular object store and you can send all the intermediate data to your scratch object store. And so like, you know, this is a huge issue that's been a, a big issue for a long time in Galaxy. And uh, Hopefully that would just be something you could do uh, with the next release of Galaxy. And hopefully, yeah, maybe, hopefully we can get this on main relatively quickly and then people can see it. Um, Amazing. 
but but it sounds like things are on track to have it available um before gcc even oh uh yeah absolutely i mean it's something that i presented at the last gcc so if you find my talk from the last gcc i did say like oh this is this is done and then it then it stagnated for several months because there was some like corner cases about how that workflow differentiation was working that i was like I didn't have the spoons for and I got distracted by a million other things but it, it it was important and I should have just like came home from the GCC and done it but um yeah uh it, it, it's 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 pretty good though I I remember very clearly your talk in Minnesota so I I guess maybe this year I look forward to um maybe seeing a live demo even sure yeah first time for everything <laughs> Dan did you want to say something Oh, I was just going to say like that kind of feature you're asking how we should, how people should discover and, and, you know, see these things. Um, that kind of stuff would be great for like a hub blog post or, you know, that kind of, you know, high level introduction. This is how you can use it today, uh, whatever. Yeah. yeah. I started doing that for a lot of the new, uh, features coming out of Bjorn's group. And I think it's really nice. Uh, John, there was an attempt to inject a little bit more um, uh, people into this. Uh, there is this person from Penn State, this Burak. Did it work or not? Um, uh, they came to uh, our last backend group. Mm -hmm. uh, we gave them a plan, and I don't know if they're working on it or not, but uh, we gave them a very nice project, again, along similar lines okay. um, about workflow scheduling. Um, I haven't seen any PRs around that, but it's only been a week or two. Um, but you know, the the idea there is is how can you get a workflow to like schedule all together? Um, and, and there's lots of different ways to approach that, but we gave a sort of nice approach that would pair well with any of this other stuff we're working on. So it's kind of it's an important project that would that like the idea behind the approach I would like I gave him to work on is like, you know, package up the whole workflow. Um, so we mentioned RO crates, like using all of that work, you know, package up the workflow, ship it to a, a remote Galaxy server, run it on what would be to that Galaxy server local resources, but maybe it's AWS configured with AWS batch. And, you know, you don't need to, you don't need Pulsar, you don't need uh, remote storage or anything because it's all just running on, on either that Kubernetes cluster or that AWS cluster or whatever, and then just pull the results back and pull all the metadata back at the end. Um, so it, it pairs well with everything else we're working on, but it's also kind of independent. Um, and I, yeah, it's only been a week or two, so I don't know. But if if that, if that if he doesn't make progress on it, it's something that we would probably, as the backend group, work on at some point, because I think it's important. If you can ping them, because they have tendency to sit on these PRs forever, uh, to the point that they diverge to an unmergeable state. So uh, I'm or I can ping them, but if you can gently ping them and then I can talk to them. Well, I don't think he's opened a PR. That's what I'm saying. I think he's still working on looking at scoping out the work I he mean, wants to do. He, my be, understanding. Or, he works, he, he probably works on his local fork. So, uh, well, okay. Um, we'll talk offline about this. Okay. Thanks. On, on a different topic, could you say a little bit more about the DER support? Uh, and, and like like you said you know that's a that's a ginormous spec and can mean a lot of different things um what what is supported now and and what will be available in the future okay so we have both client and server support um the i think probably the client support is a little bit more interesting and so the idea here is when you're uploading to galaxy you can give it urls and when you upload a URL to Galaxy, you can either say, pull the data down now or pull it down as needed. Yeah. Um, and pulling the data down as needed is, is kind of, again, something someone might think of as remote data, right? Um, and so the idea is just someone uploads a collection of DRS URIs. Maybe, maybe, they, maybe they put in a collection or maybe it's an individual data set, but all of the... Anywhere you can paste a URL into the client, so in the rule builder or in just the basic upload form or in the collection creation upload form, all of those can be DRS uh, URIs currently. Um, and that could talk to like a Gen 3 or a Teradata repo. Uh, presumably. Um, 
but okay. I think that someone needs to sit down and work through the uh, how those are resolved and make sure the um, tokens, like the security stuff is yeah. in place. But I think that Nuan stuff really, um, I mean, maybe Nuan would even be a better person to answer this question, but I mean, but that's the idea. Yeah. And, and so, um, yeah, uh, as in, in the server support is a little more obvious, just like the, the, the API can generate DRS URIs for the data in Galaxy. And right now I think it's just public data because we don't really have a token mechanism or anything. But so if you have a public data set, which a lot of data sets in Galaxy are, um, you know, I think most people, a lot of users just turn on public access to all their data sets. Um, and so then Galaxy can just produce DRS URIs. And then any other resource that consumes DRS can can pull down data sets from Galaxy using that API endpoint. Is that automatic or do you have to kind of publish a data set through with a, with a DRS URI? Uh, the data set, if the data set is public, it has a DRS, it has a DRS URI. So... As you, as you probably are aware, I mean, there's a lot of interest in the NIH clouds to kind of use um, their CRIs as sort of the preferred trans uh, way to reference data. So, you know, being able to claim, you know, being able to offer that now on main and EU and, and AU and beyond, I think will be valuable um, if you want to kind of aggregate data for across multiple sites. So that's an awesome new feature. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I I think there's like a I think it's I I haven't seen like compelling use cases of like here's a library that uses it to do something fantastic or here's a but maybe maybe I'm missing something but as I was developing this it really felt like um you know it felt like it was a lot of talk and not a lot of like there there but whenever the there is there I think we'll be there also. Um, okay. Yeah, fair. I mean, it's sort of just developing now, but I think moving forward, that'll be important. Yeah, and it's good to be a part of the conversation and to have like explored the ideas and. <laughs> yep. And then my last question, and I and I know I don't really understand all the backstory here, but it sounds like this uh, Toolshed 2.0 will be um, a major revamp. Um, and, you know, maybe try to give more focus to it because you kind of, um, Unpack that a little bit about, you know, what are some of the headline results with this? I mean, I, um, yeah, yeah, well, there's, there's, there's a lot of politics, but like, I, I think the, the thing is that the, the, the tool shed has the, 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 the number of things that the tool shed attempted to do 10 years ago, when we first published the first tool shed paper, um, what was tremendous, right? It attempted to be a source code repository, right? Like attempted to compete with GitHub. It attempted to be a package manager, right? It, you know, but but we use GitHub now. We use uh, Bioconda now, um, and so we don't want to do any of that stuff. But we have tens of thousands of lines of code in Mako, in Python backend, etc. That's just like, you know, um, it's just, it's just bit rot. It's just stuff we don't use. So we use just like we do. We use the tool shed mostly just through APIs and mostly just a couple of the APIs. Um, a couple is not fair. Uh, you know, 10 of the APIs, 10 of the 20 APIs and, uh, you know, and there's this vast UI that we just, we don't want to use any of that. We don't want to support any of that. It's become dated. It's become broken because people don't look at it. Um, and so this, this new tool shed is very lightweight. Um, it's just like um, all of the, everything to do with how you upload things to the tool shed has been removed. Because we people just use Planemo, right? People use Planemo and GitHub Actions, um, and that's what we want people to do. And so this new tool shed has information. It links out to resources about how to set those things up, but it doesn't it doesn't implement any of that functionality, right? Like it just expects you to publish things through the APIs, um, and then like all of the different ways to like search the tool shed and stuff. Like all of that has been replaced. You basically only use like the the Galaxy APIs to sort of find tools. Uh, and then like installation is ephemeris and Ansible. These things didn't exist in the past, but now they're sort of front and center in the tool shed. So if you go to a repository, instead of like, you know, all the things that you could do before, it's like, here's how you would install it with ephemeris, you know? Um, so it's it's a very slim down. And then like, you know, the old tool shed was Mako, uh, you know, basically Python 2 that had been like minimally ported to Python 3. And then um, 
you know, some jQuery stuff, but not a lot of JavaScript. This new one is a single page application in Vue, Vue 3. Um, it's uh, built with uh, Vite. Um, it uses uh, sort of material design and Quasar. So it's, it's like it's like frameworks that are sort of meant for much smaller applications. Um, yeah, and, and so the, the idea here is just that we have a small, I almost, the, the problem with publicizing it is like, I, I kind of think of it as like a backend thing you don't really need to use. And so like, um, the, the, the point is just to have something really small, I think, that, that just is uh, supporting uh, the use cases that we um, are currently using. But there, there's some new stuff there. It, for instance, it does support the GA4 GH TRS API. So we are sort of aligning with, in addition to aligning with like the fact that the world has moved beyond, like, you know, hosting your own source code and custom uh, package managers, but we're also using, you know, common APIs and stuff now also. But, and I guess, um, what do you see as sort of, you know, the world, um, you know, using sort of Toolshed 2.0 versus DocStore or other services that um, that work with some of those APIs? Like, I, I, I guess I can see a need where we'd always want our own, where we'd be stable and, um, you know, would have sort of the APIs that we need. But I, I guess I'm wondering, is there is there opportunities to, I don't know, distinguish ourselves or maybe integrate more tightly or leverage in some way? I guess I'm just interested in your thoughts. Um. My, uh, let me see. So, uh, um, my 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 rewriting of the tool shed was largely defensive. Like, I didn't want, I I didn't want a project where we like switch to something else and everything breaks. So, this yeah. is a version of the tool shed where even though all the code has been replaced at all the layers, it's like perfectly. I mean, not perfect. It's well tested and it's backward compatible. And so now if someone did have some exciting view for how one would use a tool shed 2.0, well, they can now do that in view and in fast API and with typing and, you know, uh, you, know uh, you and with TRS, you know, like it, it's a setup for someone to have some great ideas, but really it itself is attempting to sort of, um, uh, it's, it's not, it, it's not bringing any cool ideas to the table. It's just, it's meant as like, this is a piece of backend infrastructure that we mostly don't want people to touch. And if they do touch it, it shouldn't be completely broken and ugly like the current tool shed. So it's, 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 it, it looks better and it looks more modern and it's easier, much easier to develop against presumably. Um, but it, yeah, it doesn't have any big ideas. So um, yeah. I guess the big idea is just to be super stable, modern, reliable. Um, yeah. Those are I mean, one could have, one could imagine. So I, 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 I would love us. Uh, oh, my my laptop's about to die. Um, you know, aggregating how tools are used, linking out to workflows, linking out to training materials, linking out to test results for public service. This is the direction I would take it. Is sort of data integration and APIs to support that and greater TRS support. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I have no issue with Doc Store hosting Galaxy tools, and I think Marius is really interested in that project. But I also don't think that their APIs right now would support the way we use tools. So, like, I think it would be kind of, you know, it would be a check mark rather than a, you know, a, a functional thing that we could use. Got it. Got it. Thank um, you. Marius and I were actually thinking about talking to DocStore and perhaps writing a grant together. But in order to do that, it's basically we need to flesh out what the main points are. So I think that's the right discussion. Uh, so I, I think they'll be interested in working with us. So uh, offshoot of Anvil, perhaps. Yeah, and we have a great relationship with them, right? Like if things go well. I mean, I it would be it would be great to see to see what that looks like. And this 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 isn't designed like this is designed to like coexist with that, right? Because we're using a similar API now, or we're at least implementing a similar API. Um, it's not, it's not meant to compete with that. It's meant to just do what we were currently doing a little better. Thanks very much, John. Alrighty. I think our last group is UI UX, last but not least. All right. I hope I make this 
through this without a coughing fit. I managed to pick up whatever my kids had earlier this week. So I feel terrible. <laughs> um, all right. So stuff we got done. Um, the brand new workflow editor. I don't need to go into that since we've talked about it twice already. It's amazing. Um, we now have a related data set filter. It's a way to, in a, in, a, in a history, you can click on a data set, show the inputs and outputs of that. Um, we wanted to explore this as a precursor to sort of navigating a history as a graph. Um, I'll talk more about that later. Um, the multi-view history has been completely rewritten um, and it's, uh, it's working really nicely. It's all in modern view um, instead of backbone. Um, talked about the RO crate uh, export UI. It's a single export UI for multiple types of exports. Um, that's new. Um, tool search got a complete overhaul. So now in the tool panel, when you type, you immediately filter the clients, you filter an object on the client side based on your input. Um, so you're like fast filtering without even hitting the server um, to find tools. And this is the, the most common case of tool searching. You, you know, you type uh, random for random lines or something like that. And it comes up immediately without even talking to the server. Um, so that's nice. But then you can also click the advanced search and then that takes over the middle panel and shows rich results. It shows more about the tools that you're finding and it allows you to search on more metrics. So the, the left side pops down and you can see more options. It's, it's really good. Um, the tool form itself saw a bunch of usability improvements. Um, it looks nicer. Um, it's more usable because things are where you expect them to be in more places. Um, there's a PR open right now that integrates GTN tutorials uh, showing, you know, like, okay, so I'm trying to use bow tie. Here's a list of 10, 10 tutorials that use this tool. If you want more information, so you can click through and go back, um, go to the GTN and see, see those in action. <clears throat> um, there's a, the tabular data set display was completely rewritten. So it's not backbone anymore. Um, there's no Mako for it. It's all view. Um, it, it, it was kind of an exploration for a next generation of visualization. And the first step of that, I guess, is done. We need to figure out the packaging and integration um, still, but that's, um, you know, we made a bunch of progress there. Um, IT display issues uh, were uh, hopefully mostly resolved. Um, they, it, they're nice now. You can actually see an IT running in the history. You can know the status of it. You can click on the eyeball and actually get the IT instead of some, you know, uh, you know, not a data set view. Um, there's also a store there showing the status that we can leverage in other contexts um, that I'll talk about moving forward. Um, there's a huge focus on accessibility testing. Um, we had a bunch of community uh, members uh, contribute feedback and, you know, their organizations ran reports and we ran reports and we addressed a ton of little small things. Um, the tags editor got a complete rewrite. So that's all tab navigable now. Um, the history is tab, nav tab you know, keyboard navigable. Um, so you can, if you're impaired or visually impaired or whatever, you can navigate just by, just by uh, sound. Um, made a lot of progress there. We actually, uh, we, we added linting too. Um, so all view, it's only for view components, um, but all view components now will run a recommended set of uh, tests against components you're writing and say like, hey, you need an ARIA tag here, or hey, this is an inappropriate use of an ARIA tag, um, that kind of thing. Um, so that will continue to get better over time and will backslide. Um, client modernization in general uh, had a ton of progress. Uh, now we're using Vue 2.7 and all new components are written in the composition API, um, using script setup mostly. Um, so we, we, we swapped from, um, Vuex to Pina. And, uh, so all the new stores are in Pina. There are a couple of remaining stores in, in Vuex, but those will get converted along the way and we'll move away from the sort of the provi nested provider approach to composables in the composition API. And those are working really well. They're a pleasure to use in comparison to the old stuff. Um, and the, <clears throat> the client is swapping over to TypeScript. So whenever folks are writing new code, if you can, TypeScript, Composition API, and it's going to be nice modern code. It's much more fun to work with, personally, um, and it's nicer, better code in the long run. 
Um, so that that's that was a that's a, a nice change. Um, the top level application, there's one top level view app uses view router from the throughout the, the application for routing. So there's no more backbone routing there. Um, Oh, so we also, this is actually ahead of schedule. There's a, a TypeScript client for the Galaxy API um, that's auto-generated uh, based on Fast API. What Fast API presents, we auto-generate a schema, and then you can just use that in the client. You import the schema. You say, I need to touch these types of objects. Here are your options. It's got fantastic, since it's TypeScript in your editor, it's got really nice type tab completion. You can see what properties this thing, this method takes. It's It's amazing. Um, and I think that's going to be a, a game changer for our use of, I mean, you can kind of think about it like the reason we wrote BioBlend was to, so you have a nice set of objects to work with. Now we have the same thing in the client in, in JavaScript. Um, and we have a pre-built production client published. Um, it is opt-in for now, but if you set a flag, um, the expectation is that you would you would want to do this intentionally and like, if you're using Planemo test, which spits, spins up a server, it doesn't need to build a client, right? You could just install and use a client. Or if you have a playbook that runs a server that never diverges from you know, our production standard, you could just install and use the client that we have published. Um, so yeah, that's, that's done. It's opt-in for now and it will get updated um, for now manually um, at point releases, um, but it's, it's on NPM. Uh, next slide. So the stuff we still had to do, um, graph view of workflow invocation, this got touched on earlier, but basically we want to take the nice, beautiful new workflow editor uh, view that we have and reuse it to show an invocation as it's running. So you can click on an invocation and instead of getting the little box with like five out of 15 steps and whatever, an option would be show me this thing that looks like it looks like in the workflow editor with the state at each box and you could watch a workflow run um, or inspect a work a past workflow run in a in a graph display um so that will we'll get done for gcc um the notification framework we had an outreachy student last summer uh take a really good start at this um it's something both admins and, and people have asked for for a long time um, but having a, a framework in Galaxy to where, you know, a user could request a tool installation and it happens through Galaxy or an admin could say, hey, there's going to be a downtime, whatever, broadcast notifications, uh, that kind of thing. You could have uh, one of the other options, one of the other things we want to build in is a way for users to acknowledge notifications. So if you needed to send something out requiring a user, you know, say, yes, I agree to this, whatever. Um, that would be another use of it. Um, the next point view is this whole framework in the primary app. That's probably realistically a stretch for GCC, but we want to keep pushing for it. Um, it's the, you know, the tail end of a long, long, long modernization effort. Um, the big things that are still outstanding are the, some various grids, um, the upload component and a few form elements, um, for, um, we had this notion of uh, you know archived or frozen histories that we wanted to make happen. Um, for GCC, we're going to have a clear path to you know archive and download that archive and then purge a history from the server. So it won't be taking up your space. It'll just to have a, a clear use, user path to get that action done. Um, we're not writing off sort of the the concept of frozen histories, but there's so much more involved. Um, especially on the back end with uh, making that happen, um, that that's not on the table for GCC. Um, but I think we'll make nice progress towards, you know, a user, especially building on the work we did for the RO crate export and that kind of thing. You could seamlessly export a history, save your tarball on S3 or whatever, and then re-import it later. Um, so that'll be the sort of the first pass of this, this thing. Um, we want more accessibility testing. Um, so we have the linting right now, but nothing, accessibility testing is hard. Um, and a lot of the things we find are, you know, I, I tried to talk to, to Wendy about this specifically since she was super interested in it. And she said, when they do accessibility testing, they run an external test suite, but then the other thing they had, they do is they actually have a team of folks like 
click through a series of steps in a tutorial. And at each step, they look at the HTML, the elements on the page, and they see what they can touch and what they can't touch and like how it, how it works. So it's not totally automatable, but we can do a lot more in an automated fashion. Um, the low hanging fruit here that I want to implement is um, a playwright driven. So we, we have tours that exercise a whole lot of galaxy stuff um, and that, that outline common paths through the interface that users take. Um, I want to use those tours. I shouldn't say I, we want to use those tours and basically at each step of the tour, use Axe to automatically detect where there are violations. Um, Axe is really nice. I use it in my browser. You know, there's a browser plugin. Um, that's how we find a lot of our usability violations. Um, it'll check for WCAG, you know, 2.1 or double A AA or triple A or whatever you tell it to. Um, but what we could do is have these, or what we are going to do is have these playwright driven tour tests that step through the entire tour and at each step go, Hey, is anything in violation? So you'd see the upload box, you'd see the workflow run form, you'd see, you know, all the stuff. And that will give us some minimum bar of making sure we're not uh, violating accessibility guidelines. Um, visualization plugin framework enhancements. Uh, so right now, the all the visualization, the visualization installation and build process is all wrapped up with the the client build. Um, we need to totally separate that, build out APIs. Um, this got mentioned in the backend discussion, uh, but we need to build an API for admins to install, manage the registry, rebuild visualizations, and stage them. Um, and then uh, IGV.js will replace Trackster as the sort of the, the main track browser. Um, but we will, you know, as soon as IGV is integrated, it'll be fairly trivial to add JBrowse or, you know, whatever your next favorite track browser is. Um, the data set view. Um, so right now, when you open a data set card, you have like 15 different little buttons that you can click on. Um, what we want with the data set view is to have a comprehensive component that takes over the middle panel that then has a tabbed interface showing the various things you can do with the data set. Um, and this, you can imagine this being reused anywhere, um, but that'll be a nice usability week to get, get some of the noise out of the history in terms of all these little buttons and actions and things um, and give a more real estate to, you know, a central pane where you can kind of see a data set in a single view. Um, a really visible UI change that we're working on is an activity bar, kind of like in VS Code, where along the left side, you have your little sort of the different activities like testing, uh, code, get, whatever. We want that for Galaxy. So you'd have your, you know, workflows, analysis, um, ITs, that kind of stuff, all in the left panel. And that gives us a lot more real estate Historically, we've shoved some of this stuff up into the masthead, but it's just not appropriate when you have like, maybe you might have multiple ITs running or something. You might want to see those in the in this left activity bar, or you might want to pin things to the activity bar, like, you know, specific workflows. If you have a, a user that only uses like two workflows and that's all they ever need to touch, put those in the activity bar and then that's their things, right? It gives us another place to really customize um, the interface and make it specific to use cases and users. Um, the rule builder, um, it's super powerful. Um, we wanna take a pass at um, just overhauling it to maybe make take advantage of more screen real estate. I don't know that it needs to be in a modal, um, make it, you know, basically just take a pass on it, overhauling the user interface, um, think about usability concerns and just refactor it a bit. Um, and then lastly, for GCC, um, we implemented the virtual scroller in the history as a way to, excuse me, get the history working, um, the history 2.0, um, and it, it did that and it works really well. Um, there were reasons we were trying to build the virtual, instead of virtual scroller, a virtual scroll bar. Um, there's a distinct difference between those two things. Um, so things like jumping to a bookmark, jumping to a time point, things like that are very hard with just a virtual scroller. 
Um, so we need to overhaul the architecture of how how the scroller works. Um, there are also several outstanding bugs uh, related to this that we've sort of short term think we've fixed, um, but you know needs needs a bit more work. But that's slated for for uh, being done before GCC as well. Um, and then 2023, hopefully, um, but not before GCC. Um, simplified execution interfaces and entry points for um, both tools and workflows. Um, there's a good example of this on the uh, one of the HackMD documents for, you know, it's a small interface. It's got three options you can pick and then drag in a data set, that kind of thing. Um, and that would apply for tools or workflows. And then lastly, um, with the visualizations, having them bundled separately, built separately, um, and plugged in, um, it would be really nice to um, you know, build them into web components that can just be embedded wherever, whether they're on the hub or somewhere else um, that then, you know, render data from Galaxy um, in a live graph display or whatever uh, that's, that's parameterized taking in properties. Um, that's something on the wish list. I think that's it. That's, uh, well, I should say that's not it. There's a lot more stuff, but these are the highlights. Well, it's just incredible progress uh, that's made there. It feels like, um, I don't know, every pixel of the UI has been rethought out, redesigned, uh, enhanced in some way. Um, I guess along those lines, like, um, I mean, I guess, I guess it feels like, you know, you're in no shortage of, of things to work on. You know, if you, if you imagine, I don't know, a five-year or 10-year stance, are there any kind of like major initiatives that you, that you're particularly interested in, you know, that would, that, you know, where we want to be in many years time? That's a big question. Um, on a slightly shorter time scale, something that I want to do to avoid us getting stuck in sort of the the bootstrap uh so we've used historically used like bootstrap view directly right we really need to consider building an interface layer and having instead of using uh b dash tab right bootstrap tabs we really need to use like g dash tab galaxy tabs that then is an interface to bootstrap tabs and we need to insulate the application from any of these third-party libraries that that you know get locked in and then die <laughs> Like, uh, like might be the case with Bootstrap View. Um, it seemed like for a while it was getting resurrected. And then uh, over the past week, actually, there's been some news that mm, might not be. Um, so anyway, um, moving forward, we really need to build in uh, layers in the application that isolate us from those things where you have a single point of control. You can change out the Bootstrap View button for you know, a Viewtify button or something else. Um, it's not fun engineering work, but it's something that I think we really need to pay attention to over the next several years. Um, swapping to Vue 3 is, is a big thing. Um, I We're using Vue 2.7 now, which gives us most of what we want out of Vue 3 in terms of composition API and um, some of the bells and whistles. Um, so it's less of a dire concern, I guess. Um, in terms of but, but it sounds like the, the goal there is sort of separate out the sort of application logic from whatever third-party library we happen to be using at any time to- Exactly, yeah. Um, and then as a sort of follow-up question, I mean, you've, you went through, I don't even know, 500 new features here. <laughs> How do we make the users aware of, of all these new capabilities? <laughs> um, this is what I'm torn on, right? So uh, the user-facing release notes do a lot of heavy lifting. Um, for like the, the highlight stuff. Um, blog posts for things like the accessibility work, that's fantastic. I, I think we should use those uh, f those efforts as a way to you know highlight what we're doing and, and you know get a blog post out there. It's nice, it draws attention and that kind of thing. Um, I, we also need to do better in the application itself, I think, um, 
showing users how things work and how they have changed. Um, so maybe that's an expansion of and a better integration of tours or something like that to walk people through new features. Um, the blog posts have been a really nice change, though, in terms of things we can do right now. Um, that's been really nice. Yeah, um, back at the that meeting, the uh, Plant Animal Genomes Conference back in um, January, we we're talking about like the VGP workflows, and there's like you know trying to teach this to new users. There's like several la layers to it. There's sort of like the broad concepts, introducing you know the kind of the science. There is a certain level of like click here, do this, click here, do that. Um, and you kind of need to do both, right? To kind of explain the concepts and sort of drill down on the specific sort of um, operations the user needs to do. I, I, and I don't know if I have a, any sort of brilliant, I definitely don't have any brilliant ideas here, but I'd be interested to hear if you had ideas about how to make, you know, those sort of nuts and bolts operations just, I don't know, clearer. I mean, we, we strive for it always to be self-documenting, but the UI yeah. is very sophisticated. It has tons of capability. Um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, to address this, it's a project we talked about very recently that we're trying to figure out how to get done is a, a application wide glossary, right? Some sort of toggle or interaction where each component is decorated with particular things that have like extra help, you know, something that when you toggle this thing on, uh, certain things glow, and then you can click on and go, wait, what is RNA seek? And then you click on it, and it brings up a little glossary page for our, that was a terrible example, probably, but you know what I mean, right? Yes. A, a glossary type functionality built into the application that could then, you know, link to GTNs, um, what do they call them? The, like the mini micro tutorials or whatever, whatever those are. Um, it could link to that content. It could have shorter form content, um, but just sort of an integration of all of the content that we have all over the place in, in from the application itself, I think would get that, push that a lot, a lot forward. I like it. I like it. A question about this graph view of workflow invocation. So that's basically going to be the workflow view where you're going to color nodes, which as they progress. Yep. Uh, You'll see it as they progress. And once it's done, or I mean, as it's going to, you'd be able to click on a different node and see the inputs, outputs, like things like that in the yeah. right panel and explore what an invocation did, um, what went wrong, I guess, that kind of stuff. Well, that sounds awfully like just the graph view, because that's it, it, it's, yep. uh, it's a graph view with benefits. Uh, I mean, there's just, um, yeah, so uh, yeah, that would be... So is graph view going to be done first? No. Or? Yeah. So the graph view, because of the data required to show a graph view of a history is much, much harder. Um, with a workflow invocation, we already have the structure from the yeah. invocation object itself. So this is actually a, a, a next, not a first step, since we've been working on it for a while, but a next step towards getting that full history graph view done. I wonder how it would show sub workflows, but I guess maybe... Let's not go there yet. Uh, anyway, this is this is overwhelming. So in general, the, the progress of the UI group has been overwhelming. So thanks for that. It's great. I don't know if I can uh, sort of uh, say that this is it's definitely the best work group meeting we ever had. So. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, f it feels like things are, um, you know, pretty well organized. It feels like the groups have a lot of, um, I don't know, leadership, forethought, engagement. Um, it seems like the groups are working together. Um, you know, the, I saw several presentations calling out the work and other work groups. Yeah, awesome work, everyone. I'm just like totally blown away by all the updates there. And, um, now, some of us will be getting together in uh, just a couple of weeks uh, here at Hopkins. Um, you know, there'll be plenty, lots of time to kind of talk uh, shop. Uh, we have a couple of fun events uh, scheduled. We're all going to go into the lab to do some uh, uh, DNA work uh, and some social events. And then, of course, we're all super excited for everyone to come together in July um, down under, down in Brisbane.
Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks to all the working group leads for pulling together these updates. I appreciate all of that and all that you do to pull the team together. Appreciate your time, everyone. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Have a good afternoon. Yeah. Thanks. Bye, Thanks. everybody.